let's return now to Coriolanus. Uh, and I've sensed a little grumbling. Where's the poetry? This is Shakespeare. Uh, you know, where's the but soft what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east and Juliet is the sun. Instead we get What's the matter, you dissentious rogues, that rubbing the poor itch of your opinion make yourselves scabs? Coriolanus, I think, has the most marvelous opening lines in all of Shakespeare, but not for the poetry. Uh, and indeed, you know, what am I, a professor of English or something? Uh, I never promised you poetry. <laughs> I promised you political theory uh, in this course. But I think if we reflect on this issue, we will see something of what's going on here. Uh, in portraying Republican Rome, Shakespeare deliberately denies us the kind of poetry we love in so many of his plays. How many of you, uh, for you, with this the first time you read Coriolanus? Uh, it's, it's a little strange at first, uh, maybe even a little disappointing, uh, by Shakespeare's standards. Again, I mean, it's written in, a, most of the play is written in verse. It's an iambic pentameter. It is poetry. But there are none of those lyrical flights of imagination uh, that we associate with Shakespeare. But think about it. <laughs> but soft what light through yonder window breaks. What calls forth the poetry is eros. It's, it's Romeo's longing for Juliet. Uh, that produces this outpouring of lyric poetry. And Shakespeare knew that wasn't right for Republican Rome as he was trying to portray it. Now, it's not that at this stage of his career he'd given up on lyric poetry or that he'd uh, lost his ability to write it. Uh, we'll be getting to Antony and Cleopatra fairly soon. That was written at the same time, roughly, as Coriolanus. And it's filled with the lyric poetry uh, we associate with Shakespeare, uh, age cannot wither, nor custom stale, her infinite variety, uh, for uh, uh, she makes hungry where most she does satisfy, uh, Shakespeare's great description of Cleopatra. But again, it's erotic. Uh, the kind of lyric poetry that we associate with Shakespeare is most often employed in erotic situations. Uh, and if Shakespeare is trying to show something about Republican Rome, it's austerity. Uh, he can't engage the kind of erotic poetry uh, we love elsewhere in his works. He's very much in control here. In other words, the poetic texture of Coriolan is the lack of these lyrical flights of imagination are very much part of Shakespeare's effort uh, to portray uh, Republican Rome. Uh, uh, the Romantic poet Percy Shelley said wonderfully of Rome, the poetry of Rome was in its institutions. <laughs> That's an amazing claim for a romantic poet to make. But what Shelley meant by that is don't go to Rome to seek lyric poetry. What Rome was great for is its politics uh, and this great political achievement it established. Now, this was in some ways the self-understanding of Rome. You find it, for example, in Virgil's Aeneid, uh, when uh, Aeneas' father is giving him a vision, a vision of Roman future. This is in book six of the Aeneid. Uh, uh, and Caeses rather pointedly says, for other people's will, I do not doubt, still cast their bronze to breathe with softer features or draw out the marble living lines. He's mainly talking about Greeks here and you see the Roman uh, inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis the Greeks, uh, that the Greeks were greater artists, and they produced beautiful bronze statues, and uh, uh, they, could, they could create objects of art. And, and then going on, Anchises says, you know, these are all the things other people can do. Plead causes better. And the Romans sent their children to Athens, to essentially to law school. Trace the ways of heaven with wands and tell the rising constellations. So there it is. The Greeks make better statues, they make better lawyers, uh, and they're scientists and philosophers. But yours, he's addressing Aeneas now as founder of Rome, yours will be the rulership of nations. Remember, Roman, these will be your arts to teach the ways of peace to those you conquer, to spare defeated peoples, tame the proud. 
Uh, this is very much uh, the myth of Rome that Virgil was trying to create in the, in the, uh, that, you know, we're not as good at the Greeks and the arts, we're not as good in the Greeks at poetry, I'm no Homer, uh, but we can kick butt on the battlefield, <laughs> and there's no country is going to ever stand up to us, and we will rule the world. It's Virgil's way of saying the poetry of Rome was in its institutions. And I think Shakespeare is very aware of this, and it's something he's trying to tell us about Republican Roman Coriolanus by holding back his own enormous lyrical powers. And indeed, uh, in place of lyric in Coriolanus, we get rhetoric. And you'll see this in Julius Caesar as well. Uh, uh, that the very texture of the play tells us something about what Shakespeare is writing about. That the Republican Rome is characterized by the predominance of rhetoric. And so you get great speeches. You get the rhetoric of praise in Comidius' speech about Coriolanus on the battlefield. And above all, you get deliberative rhetoric. Uh, you get people deliberating in public about what Rome should do, and you get these great speeches, these great debates about political issues in Rome. Should we have tribunes or should we not? Think ahead to Julius Caesar. I'm sure many of you know that play. Uh, at the very center of the play, we get these two great speeches, uh, one by Brutus, one by Mark Antony, about the issue of the assassination of Julius Caesar. And the effort is to persuade, again and again in these two plays, uh, Coriolanus and Julius Caesar, uh, the poetry is not used to inflame desire. Uh, uh, it's used to persuade people, and it shows you something politically healthy about the Republic, that, that rhetoric uh, is at the center of people's speech, because they believe people are persuadable. Uh, and, uh, you'll see that under monarchies, it's a little less important to be able to persuade people because the monarch's in charge anyway and is going to do whatever he wants to do. Uh, though we'll see that Henry V is a great rhetorician. But uh, Shakespeare's best rhetoricians are his Republican Romans because they live in a world where political de deliberation is a fact of life, where in fact you can get something done by persuading people. And we see it even with the plebeians. Uh, in some ways, Shakespeare gives an unflattering portrait of them, but not as unflattering as some people claim, because the plebeians uh, can be appealed to by reason, uh, especially in Coriolanus. We'll see in Julius Caesar why Rome is in trouble, because the plebeians are less apt to listen to reason, but even among themselves in Coriolanus, they reason with each other. They make arguments. Uh, they don't just say, let's go kill Coriolanus. They give reasons for doing that. Uh, and so the absence of the lyric poetry and the presence of all the rhetoric in itself tells us something of what Shakespeare's saying about Republican Rome. He really is making an effort uh, to get at what's distinctive about this community. It is, I want to stress though, therefore a kind of thought experiment to get at the nature of this remarkable Roman Republic which placed politics at the center of human life and in the process conquered the Mediterranean world. Uh, uh, Shakespeare's looking at how it did it. Uh, it does not mean that he's holding up the Roman Republic as the absolute ideal political model. In fact, I think you can see already that what I'm implying here is Shakespeare makes us aware as much uh, uh, of what Rome leaves out as what it includes. Indeed, we see here, in effect, a choice. Uh, as you read the opening of Machiavelli's discourse, you see there discourses. He's uh, raising the issue of, of Rome versus Sparta. He presents it as a kind of choice. If you want a stable, long-lived republic, uh, you need the institutions of Sparta. But if you want uh, a Roman republic that will go on to conquer the world, you're going to have to put up with a lot of turbulence. Uh, you're not going to have a perfectly legislated and stable regime as in Sparta that lasts the same way for centuries. Machiavelli presents it as a choice. I think it's pretty clear which he prefers, namely the dynamic Roman model. I think in Shakespeare it's much less clear what his choice is, but I want you to be thinking from the beginning here of the issue of choice here, uh, that Shakespeare 
uh, is showing that Rome pays a price for its political preeminence. And uh, the biggest price is in terms of eros. Uh, uh, and that's why I'm using Plato's psychology here, because I think it really does help you focus on this. It's quite remarkable what Shakespeare shows in terms of the uh, denigration of eros uh, the suppression of eros in Republican Rome and the corresponding premium on thumos, on spiritedness, uh, a, a premium on, uh, on encouraging it. And now again, someone already came up to me and said, well, does this mean Republic is thumos and empire is eros? And the simple answer is yes. And indeed, we will see that when we get to Anthony and Cleopatra. You're going to see a flood of lyric poetry come in that play, and a flood of heroes. There will even be a character named Eros. Uh, and we'll talk about it when we get there, but just so you can see that um, uh, it's not just some peculiar mood Shakespeare was in that dampened his poetry for this play. He was deliberately trying to do something, and there are all these indications in the play of the suppression of Eros in Republican Rome. For example, uh, uh, when, when uh, uh, Coriolanus greets his wife, uh, this is on uh, page 19, I believe, uh, what he says is, uh, uh, no, it's not 19, it's, uh, what is it, 43, try again. Uh, yeah, page 43, so act two, scene one, line 182. My gracious silence, hail. Not the huge outpouring of love you would expect. And again, when you will see, if Anthony and Cleopatra are separated for a few minutes, they come back with big love speeches at each other. Uh, but here, <laughs> you can almost see the silence of Eros there. Uh, uh, that he has very few words for his wife here. Uh, and indeed, what's praised uh, uh, in Rome is chastity. Look at page 133. Uh, this is the way, uh, this, so this is Act 5, Scene 3, about line 65. This is how Coriolanus uh, characterizes Valeria. The noble sister of Public Publicola, the moon of Rome, chaste as the icicle that's curdied by the frost from purest snow and hangs on Dion's temple, dear Valeria. Uh, that's a very uh, literally cold description of a woman there. And it's, <laughs> she's like an icicle. Uh, Cleopatra is hot, believe me, you'll, you'll be seeing. Now you'll see there, Octavia, uh, even in Andy and Cleopatra, Octavia's sister, will be of a holy, still conversation. So this Roman ideal of chastity will survive to some extent even in the empire. But you here see what a woman is held up for, her chastity. And Coriolanus uh, is unusually chaste, C-H-A-S-T-E, for a soldier. Bottom of the preceding page, 132. Uh, uh, so still Act 5, Scene 3, about line 46. Now by the jealous queen of heaven, that kiss I carried from thee, dear, and my true lip hath virgined it ever since. Coriolanus is proud that he kept chaste, uh, uh, even in his wandering life as a soldier. Uh, uh, very different from the life of Mark Antony, as you'll see it in Antony and Cleopatra. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, Eros is contained in this world. You're not praised for the power of your love affairs in the Roman Republic. And indeed, in a very peculiar twist, a lot of the emotion and language we normally associate with Eros gets transferred from the relationships between men and women uh, uh, in this play to the heroic brotherhood of the soldiers. Uh, look at page 27. Uh, uh, when the then Martius, soon to be Coriolanus, so this Act 1, Scene 6, on line 30, says to his fellow Roman soldier, Comidius, oh, let me clip ye in arms as sound as when I wooed, in heart as merry as when our nuptial day was done and tapers burned to bedward. So emotions that we would normally associate with the love of a man for a woman, with their marital delights here, are transferred to the relationship between these two Roman generals. It even works 
cross-culturally uh, with Volsky's. If you turn to page 108, this remarkable speech from Ophidius. This is Act 4, Scene 5, about line 117. Uh, uh, now, Ophidius has a lot of reasons to hate Coriolanus and is sworn to kill him the next time he sees him, but he listens to one speech and, Know thou first I love the maid I married. Never man sighed truer breath, but that I see thee here, thou noble thing, more dances my rapt heart than when I first my wedded mistress saw besides my threshold. Uh, it shows you, in this ancient world of soldiers, a lot of the energy we normally associate with Eros has got transferred to the world of Thumas and the battlefield. Uh, uh, this has a lot of precedent in Homer, the relationship, uh, the friendship between Patroclus and uh, Achilles stands at the heart of the Iliad. Uh, there are Spartan traditions of this kind of uh, battlefield friendship. Uh, and Shakespeare is very aware of that in trying to bring it out in the play. Uh, it's what happens when valor is the chiefest virtue in the community. Uh, the, the, a lot of the emotions we normally associate with uh, erotic matters get suppressed and they tend to come out in thumos here. We see it in the family. And one of the strongest aspects of the play is the idea of the Roman family. We'll get to this in the last lecture when we talk about how Coriolanus is finally persuaded to uh, save Rome. But, but in general, we see here that the family is presented as decidedly Roman. Uh, in effect, what I'm trying to show you is that the Republic absorbs all institutions into its orbit. Uh, the family is, we would say, highly politicized here. So just look at Volumnia, who is the archetypal Roman matron. Uh, page 16, the Act 1, Scene 3, uh, the opening of that. Uh, we get this little family scene here. Uh, in the midst of all the tumult of Roman politics and Roman ba battle, but it turns out, turns out we don't get away from that tumult. First thing we hear Volumnia says, I pray you, daughter, sing or express yourself in a more comfortable song. If my son were my husband, I should freely rejoice in that absence where any one honor than the embracement of his bed where he would show most love. One of the clearest exa examples of the suppression of Eros in Republican Rome, that a woman is supposed to take more joy in her husband's campaign on the battlefield than in their sexual relations. Uh, and this, this motif is very strong in Volumnia. We see here, I mentioned, I alluded to this last time, the way even the women participate in the manliness of Rome in this notion of valor as the greatest virtue. Uh, that the uh, women who, now again, let's not forget that the, <laughs> a woman can't become a tribune, a woman can't become a consul. The women are not given a chance to participate directly in Roman politics, but they participate indirectly. And we see it here, it's very clear that Volumnia lives out uh, a vicarious life through her son, that denied her own ability to consul, be consul. You know, everything she wants is for her son to be consul. So top of page 17, around line 15 in this scene, I sprang not more joy at first hearing he was a man-child than now in first seeing he had proved himself a man. And then, again, this remarkably Roman statement about line 23, had I a dozen sons, each in my love alike, and none less dear than thine and my good Marcius, I had rather had eleven die nobly for the country than one voluptuously surfeit out of action. So no, no eros in Volumnia's family, all thumos. She wants uh, her son to be completely directed uh, towards political and military achievement in Rome, and you can see, therefore, why Coriolanus is what he is. Uh, some of the more perceptive... Uh, plebeians point out that what he does, he does uh, because he wants his mother uh, to be proud of him. And we see here how, in effect, even the women participate uh, in the regime. Now, again, this is how you get soldiers like Coriolanus. Uh, it's not so easy. 
uh, you have to breed them for the battles from the beginning. Uh, and if you want great soldiers, this is what you have to do. But Coriolanus reminds us of the core cost, excuse me, Shakespeare reminds us of the cost of this, so that, for example, on page 18, when we get this glimpse of Little Martius, uh, this is uh, still Act 1, Scene 3, about line 57, uh, when some of Valeria asks, how's the kid doing? Uh, uh, Virgilia rather uh, coyly says he's, he's doing fine, but Volumius says he had rather see the swords and hear a drum than look upon his schoolmaster. Uh, and there's the, the negative side of this Roman regime, uh, a defective education. I mentioned to you that Plutarch points to this in the way he sets up the parallel life with Alcibiades, where Alcibiades is taught by uh, Socrates, uh, uh, the Greek, uh, but in the Roman life, uh, basically, Plutarch says that Coriolanus's uh, uh, education was defective. I uh, don't think there's anything like this on Little Martius uh, in Plutarch. Shakespeare's inventing this, uh, but it's, it's a very good indication of what we should look for as being absent in Rome. Uh, uh, that uh, the education is for war, therefore it's a very limited ed education. And we get this incredible image now <laughs> of the little kid. Oh my word, the father's son. I'll swear to a very pretty boy. I'm a truth. I looked upon him a Wednesday, half an hour together. Has such a confirmed countenance. I saw him run after a gilded butterfly, and when he caught it, he let it go again. And after it again, and over and over, comes and up again, cast it again, or whether his fallen raged him, or how it was, he did so set his teeth and tear it. Oh, I warrant how he mammoth it. So, you know, we hear valor is the chiefest virtue in Rome. Here we see how it works with little kids. You praise them for ripping little insects. Uh, apart. And by the way, this is a nice little parable of the Roman treatment of the Volskis uh, here, that you kind of play with them and let them go and then finally deliver uh, the blow to them. Uh, but I do want you to see that overall Shakespeare shows us the limits of this Roman community. And one of the limits is its education. In the deepest sense, you can say uh, that Rome uh, is cut off from philosophy, uh, and especially cut off from self-knowledge. Uh, you can see that in the opening of Act Two, in Act Two, Scene One, uh, where, uh, uh, this is page 38, uh, the really interesting scene we've talked about already where Meninius talks to the two tribunes. About line 39, he says, Oh, that you could turn your eyes towards the napes of your necks and make but an interior survey of good yourselves. Oh, that you could. Uh, and then over on page 39, about line 69, he says, You know neither me yourselves nor anything. Uh, uh, again, while in effect... Uh, showing the powerful side of Rome, Shakespeare also shows what's lacking and fundamentally, and at the most basic, it's self-knowledge. Uh, everything we might associate with Socrates and the principle, uh, uh, know thyself. Uh, you'll see this come up again in the beginning of Julius Caesar, when Cassius talks to Brutus about whether he can find a mirror uh, 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 by which to see himself. Uh, and uh, one reflection of this lack of self-knowledge in Rome, and it also is reflected in the poetic texture, is the absence of soliloquy uh, in this play. Uh, uh, we love Shakespeare's soliloquies. To be or not to be, that is the question. Uh, if it could be done, when it is done, well, it would be done quickly. Uh, all these great soliloquies in Shakespeare, there are almost no soliloquies in this play, but turn to page 59 to see one of them. Uh, perhaps the most sustained soliloquy, uh, though there's one in Act 4 from Coriolanus 2. This is in the Act 2, Scene 3, uh, page 59, the middle of his, <laughs> his abortive campaign for consul. Most sweet voices, 
Better it is to die, better to starve, than crave the hire which first we do deserve. Why in this to wolvish toger should I stand here to beg of Hob and Dick that does appear their needless vouchers? Custom calls me to it. What custom wills and all things should we do it? The dust on antic time would lie unswept. Now, point, this is in rhyme, and that is very unusual. Uh, Shakespeare wrote blank verse. Blank verse is unrhymed iambic pentameter. Uh, and it's a kind of law of his, uh, uh, of his development that he wrote less and less rhyme in his plays. Uh, some of the early plays, like Romeo and Juliet, have a lot of rhyme in them. It goes along with the lyric poetry. Romeo and Juliet meet in a sonnet, uh, therefore a rhyme, 14-line poem in that play. But as Shakespeare gets older, he writes less and less rhyme, uh, and certainly not in the soliloquies uh, 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 Hamlet's to be or not to be, that doesn't rhyme. Uh, uh, I've always found this very odd. Uh, and I think the answer is that Shakespeare is giving a kind of lame soliloquy to Coriolanus deliberately here. That even in the poetry we see, it doesn't have that incredible character of reaching, searching for the truth that we see in the great soliloquies, like to be or not to be. And in particular, you see that he, he thinks this through uh, and starts to question custom and question why he's doing it. And then uh, he's almost ready to give it up. Rather than fool it so, let the high office and the honor go to one that would do thus. I am half through, the one part suffered, the other will I do. The soliloquy gets him nowhere. Uh, so should I do this? Oh, I got all these reasons why I shouldn't. Ah, I'll do it. Uh, and you see a kind of unphilosophical nature to Coriolanus here. Uh, this is a soliloquy that I'll say points to the absence of soliloquy. Uh, again, this is this is really bad writing. Uh, uh, again, if you compare it to Hamlet or Macbeth and their great soliloquies, uh, and I, I. I do not think that Shakespeare was incapable of writing a good soliloquy for Coriolanus. I, and you will see that there are great soliloquies uh, in uh, uh, especially Antony and Cleopatra or lyric passages where the characters, especially Antony and Cleopatra, just leave the whole audience uh, on stage behind them. I think Shakespeare is trying to show what the limits of these Romans are. Uh, and one of the limits is they have put on blinders. Uh, this is a community that's intensely focused on politics. Uh, it therefore means that you're not looking at other aspects of life, the erotic aspects that we'll see indulged in the empire, the philosophic aspects that get uh, explored elsewhere in Shakespeare. Okay, let me pause here. See, any, any questions thus far on this? Okay, uh, again, I'm trying to show you the peculiar nature of this Roman political community uh, as Shakespeare portrays it. And another way to see it is in the treatment of the gods uh, in, in the play. It's one of, again, I find one of Shakespeare's remarkable efforts at archaeology here. Uh, this is an attempt to understand a foreign community that was very remote in some ways uh, from Shakespeare, in some ways more remote from him than from us because we've had all this modern archaeology and uh, we can go watch uh, the History Channel and see stuff about ancient Rome. Shakespeare is really making an effort to recapture what was different about this community. Uh, and you can see it uh, in the nature of the gods. The gods who are themselves politicized, saying... This Roman Republic tries to bring everything within its own horizon. It attempts to form the comprehensive horizon of its citizens so that they are fully devoted to Rome. Uh, so the gods are seen as bound up with the city. Look at page 90, for example, uh, Act 3, Scene 3. Coriolanus, trying to bring about peace, uh, says, this is Act 3, Scene 3, about line 33, the honored gods keep Rome in safety and the chairs of justice supplied with worthy men. 
The premise here is that the gods take a particular interest in Roman politics, uh, and they make sure that Rome will have good leaders, chairs of justice supplied with worthy men. Now, this isn't unique. We see it in our own politics, uh, at least at some political meetings, uh, American politicians invoke God uh, and, and uh, try to get a kind of divine endorsement. But you might notice that gets people nervous today. Uh, we believe in the separation of church and state. Uh, anyone who pressed too far the point that the gods are participating in our elections will be looked upon as suspect, at least in some circles. Uh, but here, there really is the sense that, that, that the gods have nothing better to think about than Roman politics. Look at page 139. Another little debate between Menenius and Sicinius and Brutus. This is Act 5, Scene 4. About line 30, the bottom of page 139, Sicinius says, the gods be good unto us. No, in such a case, Menenius answers, the gods will not be good unto us. When we banished him, meaning Corinthians, we respected not them. And he returning to our, break our necks, they respect not us. Uh, you know, it's as if the gods are active participants in the Roman Republican regime. In a way, that's the crazy claim of this regime, that everybody in Rome participates in the regime, even the Roman gods. And let's remind ourselves here of the nature of ancient religion uh, in places like Rome and the, uh, the Greek world. Uh, the gods were civic gods. They were city gods. Now, uh, because of literature and the way we study it, we have a notion of uh, the Olympian gods, and we talk about Athena and Zeus and Ares and Aphrodite, and we sense that these were the gods common to the ancient Greeks or the gods <laughs> common to the ancient Romans. We forget that in actual fact, uh, in these religions as practice, these gods had specific attachments to specific cities. So that, for example, Athena was said to have a special relation to Athens, uh, and that we have the Parthenon, the temple to Athena. Uh, uh, and uh, yes, over time, uh, the Greeks and the Romans e evolved notions of uh, deities that went beyond individual cities, but they always had the sense that there were gods of their city. And, and of course, they had hundreds of gods, uh, and many of them were specific to people's families, and they prayed to their gods in civic institutions. The priests were civic officials uh, in these ancient communities. Uh, uh, if you're interested in this subject, there's a very good book uh, called The Ancient City by a French historian called Fustel de Coulange, who talks about this. Uh, uh, Shakespeare recaptures that sense here, uh, that these gods are not the kind of universal forces we associate with deity, though watch what happens later in Antony and Cleopatra. Instead, there's this sense uh, of really proprietary gods, and of course the patricians exploit this. Uh, uh, in effect, they use the gods to uh, uh, keep the plebeians in line, so that, for example, back on page five, so this is act one, scene one, about line 68, when Menenius is first trying to calm the plebeians down, he says, for your wants, your suffering in this dearth, you may as well strike at the heaven uh, with your staves as lifts them against the Roman state, uh, whose course will on the way it takes, cracking 10,000 curbs of more strongly asunder than can ever appear in your impediment. For the dearth, the gods, not the patricians, make it. Now, as the play uh, implies and as Plutarch confirms, it really was the patricians who made the dearth. They were holding back the grain from the Roman people. But here the notion is, let's, let's put the blame on the gods uh, and keep the people uh, in awe of the patricians by making the patricians seem to be favored by the gods. This is exactly what Coriolanus says shortly thereafter. On page 10, <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, so Act 1, Scene 1, about line 187, you cry against the noble senate who under the gods keep you in awe. <laughs> and that parathetical phrase there is marvelously ambiguous uh, because what Coriolanus is suggesting is we, patricians, under the gods, uh, obeying the gods as the gods' proxies, uh, rule you. But that phrase is ambiguous. It could mean we keep you in awe under the gods. We use the gods to keep you in awe of us. Uh, and I think there's a strong sense of that uh, in the play. So what I'm getting at here, the, these institutions that we today normally think of as independent of politics, religion and the family, are here very strongly subordinated uh, to the Roman Republic. Uh, it's part of its attempt to form the comprehensive horizon of its citizens. We, uh, we tend to make a distinction between state and civil society uh, in our world. Uh, uh, we think of the family uh, as independent of politics, maybe prior to politics. Uh, we think of religion as independent of politics. We think of these realms as offering a counterforce to the political, uh, that uh, people aren't completely absorbed in the political life. They have a family life. They have a religious life. Uh, now, it's going to turn out very important to Rome that the family, in some sense, is more basic uh, than the city. Uh, we'll talk about this next time when we talk about how Coriolanus gives up his plan to destroy Rome. Very much depends on a certain independent authority. Uh, 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 in the family, independent of the city. But by and large, what we see in this play is the remarkable comprehensiveness uh, of this uh, Roman regime, even to the extent uh, that the gods seem to exist within the horizon uh, of Rome. Uh, there are a couple of references to the roof of Rome in the play that you might unroof the city. And I'd like to suggest as a metaphor that Shakespeare maybe even is hinting at, that the Roman Republic has a roof. Uh, people don't look up much at the heavens in this play. Briefly, when Coriolanus is banished in Act 4, he's asked where he lived, he says, under the canopy. Uh, and I think there's one point where someone refers to Jan Clouds. Uh, but generally speaking, these people orient themselves by the city. Uh, they, they orient themselves by physical places in Rome, the Tarpeian Rock, the capital. That's what they swear by. That's what they, they are so fully citizens of Rome that it's as if they can't see beyond Rome's limits. Uh, uh, now, uh, I'll try to uh, uh, confirm this point uh, by showing you some of the stuff that Shakespeare leaves out from his source. Because uh, again, it's very useful in this case that we do uh, more so than in almost any of his plays with these Roman plays, we know he was working from Plutarch's lives. And it's very interesting to see what he leaves out. Uh, and some of this is in the back of your signet, and so I can actually refer you to it. And what I, what I want to point to is that Shakespeare had opportunities to open up uh, horizons, uh, that Plutarch refers to moments when people in Rome have visions and when they seem to be directly in touch with the gods and are not working through the city. And it does look as if Shakespeare deliberately left all that uh, out. Uh, so if you turn uh, to page 182, uh, if you've got the signet, uh, uh, the last paragraph there, uh, this is uh, after uh, Coriolanus is banished, and there's a lot of problems in the city, but look who they turn to. Now, on the other side, the city of Rome was in marvelous uproar and discord, the nobility against the commonality, and chiefly for Marcia's condemnation and banishment. Moreover, the priests, the soothsayers, and private men also came and declared to the Senate certain sights and wonders in the air, which they had seen and were to be considered of. We don't see this in Shakespeare's play. In the source, there's talk of priests, soothsayers, and private men who have certain sights and see wonders in the air. 
Uh, now, even your addition, notice dot, 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 leaves out something here. I, being the professor, uh, have the complete thing at hand here. And I just want to read you a passage doubly omitted. <laughs> Shakespeare omitted it, and even your editor uh, omitted it, not seeing that it was actually important. But that very passage I just read continues uh, 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 thus, uh, that... Uh, 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 the this uh, they're having trouble with Coriolanus, and you know the, the first embassies fail, and so uh, who did they, in Plutarch who did they decide to send? What, what North in his translation refers to as their holy anchor, for then now this is the Roman Senate they appointed all the bishops, priests, ministers of the gods. Uh, which foreshow things to come by observation of the flying of birds, which is an old ancient kind of prophesying and divination among the Romans, to go to Martius. Uh, so in uh, Plutarch, uh, they actually, uh, the city relies on these priests and soothsayers. Now, Shakespeare uh, delivered, there are several references to soothsayers. Uh, in the life of Coriolanus, Shakespeare leaves him out. Now, you're, I hope you're already thinking, ah, soothsayer, Julius Caesar. And yeah, it's going to be a very important sign of how the Republic has changed when we get to Julius Caesar, that soothsayers now have an important role. In fact, they had an important role in Coriolanus' Rome, but Shakespeare chooses to, uh, uh, to omit that uh, uh, here. Uh, and... There's a couple of other examples of this uh, going back to that. Let me get the right page number here. But, uh, uh, yeah, that passage uh, I, I just read you. Uh, here's another passage. Um, actually, this is the one that comes right after the one I first read you. That uh, 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 where they report, uh, yeah, here's, uh, uh, somebody's, they've been reporting sights and wonders in the air. And again, this is omitted from even your selections from Plutarch. There was a citizen of Rome called Titus Latinus, a man of mean quality and condition, but otherwise an honest, sober man, given to a quiet life without superstition, and much less to vanity or lying. This man had a vision in his dreams in the which he thought Jupiter appeared unto him and commanded him to signify to the Senate that they had caused a very vile, lewd dancer to go before the profession. Now you see what's different here from what we see in Coriolanus. Uh, in Coriolanus, uh, the Senate manages the gods, keeps in charge of them. Uh, if you look in Plutarch, you know, he reports some guy who says, says, you know, I had a vision from Jupiter, and I'm telling you, senators, what you need uh, to do. Uh, similarly, in, uh, in Coriolanus, in Shakespeare's play, uh, the, uh, the women uh, <coughs> eventually go uh, to try to talk Coriolanus out of destroying Rome. Uh, there are strong suggestions that that's part uh, of... Senate policy, that they've tried Cominius, they've tried Menenius, now they're going to try the women. In the source, the notion of the women going to uh, Coriolanus, uh, again, you, you, uh, comes from Valeria, uh, quite independent of the Senate, uh, and she has her own vision. This also, this is in your signet. So if you've got the signet, you can look this up on page 188 the very bottom of 188, uh, uh, where Plutarch writes uh, of Valerius. So she shouldn't, suddenly fell into such a fancy as we have rehearsed before and had, by some god, as I think, taken hold of a noble device. Uh, and then look over on 189 in the signet, about seven lines down. We ladies are come to visit you ladies, my lady Volumnia and Virgilia, by no direction from the Senate. That's what it says in Plutarch. Uh, Valeria is approaching Virgilia and saying, by no direction from the Senate, nor commandment of other magistrate, but through the inspiration, as I take it, of some God above, who having taken compassion and pity on our prayers, has moved us to come unto you. So actually, there was a lot of material in the Plutarch uh, that Shakespeare could have used to suggest that religion was an independent force in Republican Rome. 
that people were looking up to the heavens and they were having direct visions of deity uh, and they were instructing the Senate what to do on that basis. I think Shakespeare deliberately left all that out because he was trying to uh, make a consistent portrait of a Roman Republic in which even religion was absorbed into politics. Now, this is a theme which he would have noted in Machiavelli, and as I said, I'll try to make reference to Machiavelli in many of these lectures. Uh, uh, one, one of the, perhaps the best chapter in The Prince is, is book one, chapter four, uh, uh, the one the Romans interpreted the auspices according to necessity and with prudence made a show of observing religion when forced not to observe it. And if anyone rashly disdained it, they punished him. This is a part of a, a section towards the beginning of book one on uh, religion and the Roman Republic. And I, I'm going to read uh, somewhat lengthy because if you haven't started Machiavelli yet, I want to whet your appetite how good it is. Uh, 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 and here Machiavelli talks about the importance of fortune-telling among the Romans, you're going to see it in Julius Caesar. You're going to see it in Antony and Cleopatra. Coriolanus del uh, deliberately suppresses this aspect. This was these augurs, and they took the auspices. Among the other auspices, they had in their armies certain orders of augurs whom they called chicken men. That's why you must use this translation, because it's literal. Uh, uh, and you get the great phrase, chicken man. Uh, and whenever they were ordered to do battle with the enemy, they wished the chicken men to take their auspices. If the chickens ate, they engaged in combat with a good augury. If they did not eat, they abstained from the fight. So <laughs> this does not sound like the most militarily sound policy here, to let your strategy depend upon the appetite of chickens. But Machiavelli comes back, nonetheless, when reason showed them a thing they ought to do, notwithstanding that the auspices had been adverse, they did it in any mode. But they turned it around with means and modes so aptly that it did not appear that they had done it with disdain for religion. So be, you know, if the religious advisors are not giving you the right advice, figure out some way to make them do so. And so he gives an example uh, in a, uh, a Roman battle with the Samnites, you know, like the Etruscans, one of these other people that the Romans battled with in Italy. Um, but when the chickens did not eat, the prince of the chicken men, seeing the army's great disposition to engage in combat and the opinion of the captain and all the soldiers that they would related to the consul uh, that the auspices went well so as not to deprive the army of the opportunity of working well. So this chicken man is smart. Uh, so while Papyrus was ordering the squadrons, some of the chicken men said to certain soldiers that the chickens had not eaten. So the head chicken guy was smart. He falsely reported the auspices because he knew the Romans needed to go into battle. Uh, but some of the chicken men said to certain soldiers that the chickens had not eaten. They told it to Spirius Papyrus, nephew of the consul. When he related to the consul, the latter responded at once that he should try to do his duty well. That is, for him and the army, the auspices were good. And if the chicken men had told lies, they would return to his prejudice. So that the effort would correspond to the prognostication, he commanded the legates to place the chicken men in the front of the fight. Then it happened that when going against the enemy, a javelin thrown by a Roman soldier by chance killed the prince of the chicken men. Sure, uh, by chance. Uh, when the consul heard this, he said that everything was going well and with the favor of the gods, for by the death of that liar, the army had been purged of every fault and of all the anger that they assumed uh, uh, against it, and they go on and win the battle. And then I can't resist telling his other story here. Uh, there's now, they're now battling in Sicily against the Carthaginians. And we've got a, Appius Pulcher as the commander. For when he wished to fight with the the chicken men take the auspices. And when they related that the chickens had not eaten, he said, let's see if they wish to drink. And had the chicken men thrown in the ocean. <laughs> then fighting, he lost the battle. For this he was condemned at Rome and Papirius honored, not so much because one had won and the other lost, as because one had acted against the auspices prudently and the other rashly. Uh, nor did this mode of taking auspices tend toward any other end than to make the soldiers go confidently into the fight. So, I mean, one theme in Machiavelli is the genius of the Roman Republic was to subordinate religion to politics. 
and to keep religion firmly under political control here, even when you had to be somewhat deceptive about it. And I think Shakespeare's uh, picked up on that. Uh, and in particular, you see here how uh, the gods function. They function to give confidence to the Romans, uh, to make them feel that they're going to win. And one thing I'd like to stress from all of this is the emphasis on uh, human agency in the Republic, the idea that people have power uh, and what happens is the result of their efforts. Uh, uh, and therefore, there's an interesting conception of fortune in the play. Uh, uh, a lot of these Romans uh, uh, appeal to fortune, but in a way that suggests that fortune is on their side. Look, for example, at page 23. Uh, this is uh, Act 1, Scene 4, about line 45. Uh, this is Martius, the then Martius, our Coriolanus, uh, uh, who sees the gates open of the Volsky city and says, come on, tis for the followers, fortune widens them, not for the flyers, mark me and do the like. This is the Roman equivalent of God helps those who help themselves. And it's basically saying that fortune goes with the people who pursue the followers, not the flyers. By the way, again, since you have the signet edition, if you turn to page 165, you'll see there at the bottom, uh, crying, them, crying out to them that fortune had opened the gates of the city more for the followers than the flyers. Why don't you see how carefully Shakespeare worked with Plutarch here? Some of the famous lines in these plays actually come right out of Nord's translation of Plutarch here. This is a particularly strong example, but there are uh, many of them. But anyway, this is what we see here, the tendency of the Romans to identify themselves with fortune. You see it again on the page 25. So Act 1, Scene 5, about line uh, uh, 20. Larsha is saying, now the fair goddess... Uh, fortune fall deep in love with thee and her great charms misguide thy opposing swords. Bold gentleman, prosperity be thy page. Uh, these Romans mainly invoke the gods in the sense that the gods are on their side. Uh, and that's why they're going to conquer. Uh, and again, this is a city that breeds this strong sense of human agency. It is a a city that gives agency to its people. That's what I meant when I talked about the extensive level of pol political participation in the Republic. Uh, that the many offices in the Republic and the quick turnover of the offices means that most Roman men, again it is restricted to men, can have the experience of feeling they've ruled the city or at least participate in the rule. And again, what's most remarkable here is the tribunate that even these disenfranchised poor people, the plebeians, can get to participate uh, in, in the city. And that breeds a sense of human agency in them. Uh, that they actually are... Uh, uh, one thing we'll be tracing here is the movement from citizen to subjects. What we see here in Coriolanus uh, in the world of the Roman Republic is a world of citizens. Uh, first and second class citizens to be sure, but they're still citizens. And a lot of the characters are named citizen, first citizen, second citizen. They call each other citizen. Uh, this arc we're looking at in these first three plays, the movement from Republic to Empire, is a movement from human beings as citizens to human beings as subjects. What, what, the, what the empire will deny to human beings is a sense of human agency. Uh, uh, and we'll see that. And, and soothsayers are going to become a lot more important. Uh, in, uh, you can see even from Machiavelli, you know, the, the Roman commanders know what's going to happen because they know they've got good armies and they know when they're going to win. And so they just want to... Uh, maneuver the auspices so it looks like the gods support them, uh, but they're not really doubting whether they're going to win or not. Uh, we'll see how things change already in the world of Julius Caesar, and especially in Antony and Cleopatra, when, when these Roman uh, citizens start to lose their faith in, in their own 
uh, uh, sense of human agency. Whereas here, you know, look at Coriolanus is the greatest tribute to human agency you can imagine. He, he conquers his city single-handedly in Act One. We eventually learn that he's the difference in battle. If he leads the Romans, the Romans win against the Volskis. If he leads the Volskis, the Volskis win against the Romans. What greater tribute to human agency could you have here? Uh, uh, this is a world in which uh, uh, of great human self-confidence. And again, that's one reason why these characters are so good uh, at, at winning battles, is they do have this great confidence um, in themselves. Uh, ultimately, it may be misplaced. And again, we have to consider that in the larger picture here. Uh, but it is what Shakespeare is suggesting about this world uh, of, of the ancient republic. What it breeds in people is a sense that they make a difference, that individual human beings make a difference. Uh, 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 and that's why they can be so valorous. Now, let me pause here and see any questions thus far. Okay, now let me try to describe a little more now the nature of this community uh, that Shakespeare's portray here. And one thing I'd like to stress is how small it is. Uh, uh, and again, this is Rome at its beginning uh, when it was a relatively small community. We have, actually, when you picture Rome, you're thinking of imperial Rome. Almost nothing survives of the Republic uh, in modern Rome enormous things of the empire survive. The Colosseum, that's empire, is built by Trajan. Uh, the whole forum, you know, built by Julius Caesar and Augustus Caesar. The Palatine Hill, all built by Roman uh, emperors. The Circus Maximus. Uh, uh, almost everything you picture when you picture Rome uh, is imperial from, from the year one or later. Uh, uh, it's famously said of Augustus, the, the man Octavius Caesar, uh, that he found Rome a city of mud and he left it a city of marble. All that grandeur is imperial uh, Rome. There are a couple of temples uh, uh, that survive from imperial uh, Republican Rome, and there's a little stretch there. And they tend to uncover things in Rome when they're building the subway. Uh, and there's a spot called Largo, Argentina, where there are a handful of... Uh, uh, Republican temples they uncovered, and thousands of cats, I might add, but I don't think they're original. Uh, uh, but anyway, it is interesting that we forget how small Republican Rome was, and all that the grandeur of Rome is imperial grandeur. So you have to remember it was a, uh, you know, by Augustus's time, it was a city, I think, of a million people already, uh, but uh, we're talking about thousands. Uh, and you see, I pointed out to you that patricians and plebeians are differentiated, but they speak to each other. Uh, and so it, it really has the nature of a small town, or to go Greek on us uh, and introduce another concept of a polis. Uh, now, polis is the Greek word for city, uh, and we often translated today as city-state, but I'm going to be careful not to do that because I want to emphasize that it's quite distinct from the state, the modern state, as a foreign community. When we call it a city-state, we imply that the state is the norm and somehow the polis is a defect. Uh, 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 polis is just a, a, a little would-be state. Uh, the little state that could have, you know, as if Athens were a pint-sized Canada. Uh, uh, and I'd like to suggest that the polis uh, is an alternate mode of organization. Y yes? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And in the and then in the Utar original, which is excerpting on which I've read, this same this 
suppressed parts about the soothsayers. The sedative exerts rational control over the soothsayer. So it's not it's not like the desecration of the Hermai or the or something. I mean, the yeah. Senate deals very well with the soothsayers. There's no promotion. And then, then so the Shakespeare suppresses that, which just means like to me it seems like then is the portrait of Rome's way of handling piety in the play. It seems to be it seems to be further away from Machiavelli than if you had kept in the Okay, the yeah. Material. So I wonder why. I mean, in one idea I had that I had worked yeah. out is that, in a way, uh, the family is not under, it's not, inher- it's not inherently under the control of the policy. It hasn't actually been politicized, except insofar as somehow his mother does it. And, but, but somehow it stands out as, uh, it has, it's still independent. And, 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 it would, so in the play, yeah. then in maybe in what you get out of just reading the life before he writes, yeah. the family's made more, an emphasis on its secrets, somehow still independent. Okay. So, <laughs> filial piety because there isn't, because patriotism to Rome isn't strong enough to overcome these. Yeah, I'll talk about that next time because we need to talk about why Coriolanus doesn't destroy Rome and how his family is able to persuade him. I think you're right. You could say that Shakespeare in this play stresses uh, more of the family as a source of independence from the city than religion. But I think his suppression of the incidents in Plutarch is part of an overarching pattern I hope to reveal as we go through the plays, that as you're going to see in Julius Caesar, people do start turning to the heavens, and they start having visions of the heavens, and it really churns things up in Rome. And I think Shakespeare deliberately uh, overstressed the contrast by repressing anything in his source that would suggest that people uh, were turning to the heavens uh, uh, in Republican Rome. So does that help as a the progression of the Roman plays to show like, the political origins of Christianity? You, we might be jumping a bit ahead here, but yes. Uh, uh, on, your, on your thesis. But yeah, 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 I mean, it, it shows the unfolding of... Uh, alternate sources of authority than the city here. Uh, anyway, uh, what I, <laughs> to get back, <laughs> to, no, it's, it's a good question. I'm glad to open up uh, the, the issue. But uh, I, I, I want to say something about uh, the nature of the policy, because I think uh, one of the most remarkable things about this play is Shakespeare's effort to understand the polis as an alternative to modern politics. <laughs> Uh, that this was, again, a remarkable act of intellectual archaeology uh, at a time when the Roman Empire loomed in people's imaginations when they thought about Rome, that Shakespeare tried to think back to the Republic and think back to the kind of community that it represented and especially the effect of its smallness. Uh, uh, That's the way that Rome is able to politicize everything. Uh, One reason the early republic is able to work at absorbing the family into the city, work at uh, absorbing religion into the city, is it's a small city. It's characterized, uh, you might say, by one degree of separation. We all know the great idea of six degrees of separation. But the polis could be defined in terms, it's a community where if you don't know everybody else personally, you surely know one person who knows any other given person. Uh, Again, these cities like Athens, maybe 300,000 citizens, uh, that's fairly large, but incredibly small by compared to modern states. Now, the great writing on the polis is book one of Aristotle's Politics, uh, and you might take a look at that, where he defines uh, the polis, uh, and it, it, it's very interesting how he defines it, because he defines it in terms of human self-sufficiency, uh, that the polis is uh, in effectively the smallest human community that is self-sufficient. Uh, And in particular, and again here, um, Plato is a a forerunner of Aristotle in this respect, the discussion of the division of labor uh, in Plato's Republic. Uh, In some ways, the polis follows from 
uh, the idea of division of labor, which the Greeks remarkably were the first to think of. Uh, that is, what precedes the polis is the family, the tribe, the small town. What characterizes the polis in Aristotle's terms is, if you will, the fullness of the professions. Uh, uh, that prior to the polis, you know, basically everybody's a farmer. Uh, and therefore, a uh, tailor and a shoemaker, every household is pretty much producing uh, what it needs. What characterizes the polis is you have now shoemakers, uh, uh, you have uh, 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 furniture makers, carpenters, and so on. Uh, that it's a it's a large enough community to to uh, uh, sustain the division of labor. And therefore, the polis is the community that can produce all it needs, produce its food, and then produce all the goods and services uh, uh, it, it needs. Uh, that's what I mean when I say it's the unit of human self-sufficiency. It may still trade with other polis, but the idea is a polis is of a sufficient size so it can sustain what we would call an economy. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, on the other hand, it's not so large uh, that its power is diffused. Uh, what Aristotle thinks about as this community is that it can stand for something. Uh, it can stand for justice. It can have its particular ideas of justice. It can argue about them. And Aristotle is worried about communities that are too large. You've, you've all heard this statement from Aristotle, man is a political animal. Now, what that is usually taken to mean in our common discourse is, you know, we're all contentious, we all are political, we all like to argue about things, we all have uh, political streakiness. That's not at all what that statement means in book one of Aristotle's politics. What Aristotle is saying is man is that animal uh, whose nature it is to live in the polis. And that's an incredible claim, because if it's true, we're all living in unnaturally large communities. And that's indeed what Aristotle would say uh, when he looked, would look at modern nation states, uh, uh, that, that we are living in artificially blown up communities which are just too large for people to know each other and to have common ideas of justice and the good and so on. And, you know, when you start to think about that, there's some truth to that. And it's very interesting the way the city has still remained a unit of human organization, even in the era of nation states. And many of us identify with our cities. Uh, I was born a New Yorker and will always be a New Yorker, even though they have me living in Charlottesville, this pre-civic community by Aristotle standards. Uh, but anyway, uh, I won't go into this, but it's very interesting. I, for example, think that the city has remained the unit of culture, even in the modern world of nation state. But in any case, I mention this to you so you'll see that this notion of the polis has a certain charge to it uh, that suggests that this is a, a alternate form of community, and Aristotle would argue the best. And superior, you know, he compares it to empires. He, he finds Babylon laughable in the politics because it's so big. The city was so big that when it fell, one part of it didn't hear about it for three days. That's the one joke in Aristotle's politics. Uh, but, uh, 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 and I think Shakespeare grasps this. Uh, that a lot of what we see in Coriolanus is the smallness, you could almost say the hominess of the community. Uh, that when these people vote, they don't have to watch the thing on TV, which is our modern answer to the polis. Uh, you know, they can go right up to Coriolanus and check them out. Uh, it's a very different kind of community, uh, and a lot <laughs> follows from that. Uh, given the smallness of the co this community, it really can bring its weight to bear on individuals. People are visible. They are uh, on display in this small community. You cannot hide things from people. Now again, one of the arcs we're going to be looking at is what happens to Rome as it gets bigger and bigger. 
physically bigger, geographically bigger. And we're going to see that transform the nature of the community. What we see here is very much what Aristotle suggests about the polis, uh, namely that this is an attempt to form the comprehensive human community. Uh, and that means to form the comprehensive uh, horizon of his citizens, so that uh, one way of understanding the polis as opposed to our modern nation state, there's no separation of church and state uh, in an ancient polis. Uh, the religion is civil religion, civic religion. Uh, again, we, we make these generalizations about Greek religion now, but there was a religion of Athens, a religion of Corinth, a religion of Sparta. They actually had different gods or gods inflected differently for each city. They prayed to their gods in specific civic ceremonies. And that's very foreign uh, uh, to our idea, uh, our, our ideas today. It's very hard for us in a way to get back and understand these ancient civil religions where, again, and for example, the, the, the priests were magistrates. They were civic officials. They were, in some cities, elected. Uh, and, uh, but I think Shakespeare understands that. That's, again, what I find remarkable about this archaeological effort on his part here, uh, that he sees what it is for Rome to try to form the comprehensive horizons of its city, and that means even their horizons about the divine. Uh, that the gods are brought into the city. This is a, a, a staggering idea uh, in the ancient world. You can see it in Aeschylus, uh, in the Oresteia, what in the last play in that trilogy. The gods are brought into an Athenian courtroom and you know, made to testify uh, by Athenian rules. This, again, is very foreign to modern notions of divinity uh, in our three great revealed religions in the West, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, where there's one God and he transcends this world and he surely transcends political boundaries. These religions uh, uh, are not limited to particular political communities. The ancient religions were, and Shakespeare understands that, although again, we're going to see how that breaks down as the Roman Republic uh, expands and tries, in a way, to incorporate too much. In a way, we'll see how the Roman Republic bites off more than it can uh, chew. Uh, so again, the, the, this um, uh, notion is, is so foreign to us, we have to work on getting back to the idea that the polis was the community that encompassed all other communities. Uh, they all were subordinate to us. Uh, to, to it. Uh, and again, that's the, this notion of the polis as a unit of self-sufficiency. But that then leads us, well, actually, I should, any questions about that? <laughs> He'll come back in a few minutes with one. Uh, but, uh, okay, I want, I want to explore this idea of self-sufficiency because it's also the characteristic of the ancient hero. And now we start to get to the tragic tension between the city and the hero. Again, the claim of the polis, in a way, is titanic, that it's the all-encompassing human community, so much so that even religion is incorporated within its political boundaries. Uh, and again, you can see how much that works in Rome, uh, as Shakespeare portrays it in Coriolanus. But now we've got this hero, Coriolanus, uh, and what uh, uh, characterizes him uh, he says it himself uh, uh, on page 132, this is Act 5, Scene 3, when his mother comes to supplicate. Uh, this is uh, Act 5, Scene 3, page 132, about line 35. I'll never be such a gosling to obey instinct, but stand as if a man were author of himself and knew uh, no other kin. Uh, that is, offers us such an insight uh, into Coriolanus there uh, uh, that what he's, his fundamental claim as a hero is to be self-sufficient. Uh, it's something that the tribunes recognize as well. This is back on page 78. So Act 3, Scene 1, uh, uh, about line 265 bottom of page 78, 
where is this viper that would depopulate the city and be every man himself? This goes right to the heart of Coriolanus as a hero, that he wants to be as if a man will author himself and be every man himself. This uh, is the uh, hypertrophy of Thumas, if you will. This is Thumas carried to a higher power. And let's go back to that notion of Eros and Thumas, and that's why I keep invoking the Platonic uh, psychology here, which I think is profounder than modern psychology, and Shakespeare picks up on it. Uh, uh, in a way, Thumas is the desire to be self-sufficient, uh, whereas Eros is the acknowledgement of our lack of self-sufficiency. Uh, Eros is a yearning for completion and therefore implies that we are incomplete. Uh, Coriolanus understands this when he says of Rome, I shall be loved when I am lacked. Really points to the nature of Eros then. Eros reflects a lack. We, we lack something uh, and we yearn for it. Now on the most elementary level of appetite, you know, we lack food and we yearn for it. One of the uh, uh, manifestations of eros is this yearning to complete yourself with food. Uh, I saw an ad in the tea coming in today of an ice cream sundae, uh, uh, some brand, and it said, uh, uh, when he leaves you, I'll be there for you. <laughs> of this, I, what a sinister ad. <laughs> But man, it tells the human truth. Uh, uh, that's the nature of eros there. It is So obviously sex. Yeah, the learning, the yearning for completion. In Plato's Symposium, the great dialogue on eros, Aristophanes tells this hilarious myth where human beings were once literally bisexual. Uh, they were male-male, male-female, or, uh, or female-female, and they got uppity, and Zeus split them in half. Uh, so they'd spend all their time trying to recover their other half and wouldn't assault Zeus anymore. And there's the notion we were once, you know, we all we once had uh, four arms and four legs, and now we're in, ha and, and sex is that desire to... to be complete, to reform that whole. Uh, and so indeed, yeah, eros is this desire for completion and always reflects a sense of incompletion. Whereas thumos is that notion, yeah, uh, of drawing the line, of I'm complete, uh, I can stand on my own, I don't need nothing or nobody. That's why, for example, thumos takes the form of saying, I don't need drink, I don't need food, I don't need sex. Uh, you know, the, uh, the hero, uh, and again, Achilles is such a great image of this in the, uh, in the Iliad, and Coriolanus is. Uh, we see here this human drive to be self-sufficient. Now, that's very important militarily. Uh, that's why Thumos is characteristic of these great military figures. They have to be... Uh, uh, capable of standing their ground, of standing on their own. They can't be needy, weak people always looking for completion or something. Uh, uh, no, the no, very notion of thumos, as translated into military terms, is to stand your ground as if a man were author of himself and knew no other kin. Uh, and it's so characteristic of these thumotic Men, although again, thematic women are uh, very possible as well, and Volumni is one of them, is, you know, anger's my meat, I sup upon myself, I don't need you, Meninius, uh, I can stand up uh, to, to anything, and certainly in the case of Coriolanus, it's what makes him such a leader uh, in battle, such a heroic figure. But here's where we start getting to tragedy now, because we have two claims to self-sufficiency. The polis claims to be self-sufficient, and its hero claims to be self-sufficient. Uh, uh, and one can't do without the other. Uh, the, 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 the city claims to be self-sufficient, uh, but in crucial moments, it needs to rely on these heroic soldiers to defend it. Uh, uh, and at the same time, these heroes claim to be self-sufficient. It's what makes them heroes. Alone I did it. <laughs> Almost the last words Coriolanus speaks. Uh, I fluttered your Volskys and Coriols 
alone I did it. That's the great claim of Thumas. Uh, I did it. I made the difference. You know, it's the story of Achilles. Uh, when he fights for the Greeks, the Greeks win. When he doesn't fight for the Greeks, the Trojans win. Uh, uh, you've got this hero claiming to be self-sufficient. But wait a minute. Do these guys really win battles single-handedly? Occasionally they seem to have their moments, but I heard there was an army involved uh, as well. In fact, Coriolanus lead, leads to, uh, needs to lead troops into battle. And so uh, the, I think the deepest level of this play is examining the claims to self-sufficiency of the polis, of the city, and of the hero. And both claims are shown to be very important and at the heart of what makes the city of Rome great, what makes Coriolanus the hero great, but both claims are deeply suspect. You know, Rome claims, you know, we're the toughest city in the world and we can beat anybody uh, and we're this great community and we got tribunes and we got consuls and no one can stop us. And then one guy leaves town goes over to the other side and suddenly Rome's on the verge of being burned to the ground. And by the same token, you've got Coriolanus saying, hey, yeah, I'm the guy that makes the difference. Uh, look at this. I can beat Volsky's as a Roman. I can beat Romans as a Volsky. And yet, you know, his mother shows up and two scenes later he's dead. Uh, uh, and I, I think you really get at the heart of tragedy um, in Shakespeare in general, but specifically in this play and, and in these Roman plays, this, this tragic insufficiency of these claimants to self-sufficiency, that this play really turns on the tension between the city uh, uh, and the hero, and that's what we'll ex explore next time on, on, on Thursday, looking at the working out of this sort of dialectic of uh, uh, problematic self-sufficiency uh, in the city and the hero. Okay, just a couple, any remaining questions? Okay then, we'll see you on Thursday.